ओके तो शुरुआत में कुछ कुछ इनोवेशन वगैरह है फ्रॉम द प्रेसिडेंट एंड सेक्रेटरी या नो नो आई विल जस्ट आई विल जस्ट से अ फ्यू वर्ड्स एंड इनवाइट यू एंड यू टेक देन वी डायरेक्टली गो टू द प्रोग्राम ओके बिकॉज़ आलोक सर अमित सर दुबे साहब विकास गुप्ते सर निखिल उमेश बाला ऑल आर देयर एंड विशाल इज देयर राइट विशाल हैज टू जॉइन कुदनानी गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीवन वी वेलकम यू ऑल टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन and to introduce today's program i hand over to the convener dr arvind kulkarni uh, good morning uh, everybody uh, we thank uh, intas and uh, kalzis for sponsoring this particular uh, uh, episode uh, the first part that is the journal club and case presentation is uh, promoted by intas and we have a wonderful session on microscopic uh, techniques in uh, minimal access surgery Uh, that is uh, being uh, sponsored by Carl Zeiss, uh, the one of the biggest um, uh, uh, makers of microscopes. Uh, microscopes uh, make life look big, and we have big surgeons today doing big surgeries using small portholes. So, without uh, beating around the bush, I'll transfer uh, my mic to uh, Dr. Ranjit uh, Unni Krishnan, who is the MC for today's show. Uh, dear Ranjit, hi. Good morning, all. On behalf of the Misab, I invite you all for this fourth edition of this Misab uh, tutorials. Today we have a stellar faculty. We have our president, Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande, our vibrant secretary, Dr. Arvind Kulkarni, along with faculties all over the country, and our technology partner, Dr. Uh, Neeraj Bijlani from Ortho TV. So let's first start with the uh, journal club. We have Dr. Vikesh Pushparaj. the upcoming spine surgeon from chennai who is going to present this uh, paper uh, uh, on a very interesting article uh, welcome you please please go ahead yes yeah, sir thank you sir good morning senior shall i start sir yeah please go ahead yeah sir so today's paper of our journal club is a recent review paper from the global spine journal the topic of the paper is the role of uh, minimal access in the treatment of uh, spine metastasis the paper is from ori brazil et al from the ketling cancer center new york this is from the uh, april 2020 edition overview of this paper is the treatment algorithm when to use minimal access decompression when to use minimal access stabilization Why cement augmentation and the use of radio frequency ablation and the advantage of navigation and robotics in minimal the spine surgery. The challenges in spine metastasis treatment are most of the metastatic patients are sick patients with severe osteoporosis and complications of primary tumor treatment and the mental status of the patient has to be taken in care during the treatment consideration of spine metastasis. The spine. metastasis treatment is a multimodal treatment involving surgery pre and post op radiotherapy and chemotherapy in our today review paper we will be highlighting the role of uh, treatment algorithm of minimal access spine surgery in spine metastasis the spine metastasis guideline is given by tomito score tokuhashi norms framework since score and epidural spinal cord compression grading scale the treatment algorithm is mainly based on norms specific uh, framework norms facilitate the decision making by accessing the four key factors such as a present neurology of the patient oncological type of the tumor mechanical stability of the spinal column and the systemic problem in the neurological consideration includes the presence of myelopathy and the radiculopathy and the degree of epidural spinal cord compression which is measured by epidural spinal cord compression scale the patients with epidural spinal cord compression scale grade of 2 and 3 or high grade who need surgical management in the form of decompression with or without stabilization since core is used to find the mechanical stability of the spinal column uh, the patients with since core of more than 7 need surgical intervention in the form of stabilization thus the major indication of spine metastasis or symptomatic spinal cord compression and mechanical instability both of which can be treated uh, using minimal access spine surgery techniques the goal of uh, minimal access spine surgery in this condition or to decompression of the spinal canal and the stabilization of the stabilization of the spinal canal 
the advantages of the minimal access spine surgery are blood reduces the blood it reduces the blood draw uh, muscle damage is less and the hospital stay of the patient is reduced post operatively uh, early radiotherapy can be started with minimal access spine surgery compared with open surgery where the risk of wound complications frequently delays the radiation therapy coming to our paper the treatment algorithm of minimal access spine surgery in spine metastasis with vertebral compression high grade epidural spinal canal compression score and spine instability scores more than 7 first is the minimal access spine surgery decompression through tubes it is advocated for radio resistant tumors with high grade spinal cord compression that is scores of 2 and 3 followed by radiation treatment second is decompression with or without facetectomy and stabilization is advocated for patients with mechanical radiculopathy due to the axial loading below the level of conus and stereotactic body radiation therapy in spine metastasis post operative sbrt provides durable and consistent local control irrespective of tumor volume or tumor histology it diminishes the need of extensive tumor excision to provide circumferential spinal decompression integration of sbrt has reduced mostly it eliminated the purpose of gross total resection a lot of studies has established the safety and efficacy of sbrt demonstrating a high rate of tumor control with low complication profiles and third coming to the minimal access spine surgery stabilization without decompression which is advocated in patients with mechanically unstable radio sensitive tumor without high grade spinal cord compression normally the fracture morphology determines the plan of vertebral body cement augmentation alone or the vertebral cement augmentation plus instrumentation first of it is balloon kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty is advocated for a mechanically unstable fracture without extensive posterior cortical destruction or posterior edema involvement these patients require post procedure radiation treatment also whether to use balloon kyphoplasty or not balloon kyphoplasty versus vertebroplasty kyphoplasty may result in retropulsion of fragments or tumor into the spinal canal which will increase the epidural spinal canal compression therefore kyphoplasty should be avoided in patients with high grade epidural tumor in those situations vertebroplasty is indicated particular uh, percutaneous screw fixation combined with kyphoplasty is advocated in mechanically unstable fractures without extensive posterior cortical destruction or fracture extension into the posterior element the addition of percutaneous instrumentation provides stabilization of the posterior element in addition to the more robust stabilization of the vertebral body fractures <laughs> the percutaneous fixation only is advocated for radio sensitive mechanically unstable fractures such as multiple myeloma uh, melanoma breast primaries followed by radiotherapy polymethyl methoslate cement injection improves the osseous purchase of the pedicle screws through the penetrated screws the patients who had undergone only balloon kyphoplasty experienced significant better pain reduction and improvement in disability indexes that persisted up to 6 months similarly for vertebroplasty the pain reduction has been shown in patients treated for spine metastasis which is not mentioned in our paper coming to radio frequency ablation radio frequency ablation is a percutaneous procedure in which an electrode is percutaneously inserted into the involved vertebral body to deliver the high frequency alternating current into the lesion resulting in heat generation protein denaturation and subsequent coagulative necrosis radio frequency ablation has traditionally been limited to posterior vertebral body lesions due to the close proximity to the neural elements combined radio frequency ablation and ra- vertebral augmentation has benefit which has been proved in couple of papers but which is also not mentioned in our paper coming to navigation and robotics for a minimal access surgery it improves the hardware placement accuracy and the decreases the risk of pre operation given the risk of surgical mo- morbidity and complications it minimizes the surgical exposure time operative time and the complication factors thus minimal access technique gained performance prominence in the treatment of extra dural spine metastasis and has got a lot of clear role in the treatment of metastatic spine tumors and mainly in instability and high grade epidural spinal canal compression the advantages includes 
a reduced blood loss, shorter hospital stay, decreased the systemic stress of surgery, low risk of complications. Most importantly, the rapid return to the systemic and radiation therapy. The percutaneous instrumentation and stabilization, cement stabilization, has been widely used in the treatment of minimal access, of meta, uh, minimal access surgery in metastasis spine tumor who had got instability as well as can all compromise. The major limitations of our paper are there are no comparative data of patient-related improvement and clinical improvement with the minimal access surgery and open technique is lacking. And no comparative data evaluating open versus minimal access for extradural metastasis to determine whether this is clinically meaningful. There is a clinically meaningful difference between both open and minimal access. Third, the indications of radiofrequency ablations with tumor control and the radiofrequency ablation with cementing was not explained clearly in our paper. This is the treatment algorithm and the take home points are minimal access decompression is advocated in radio resistant tumor. Vertebroplasty is better for high grade epidural spinal cord compression. Percutaneous screw fixation is enough for radio sensitive spine metastasis. And the integration of systemic body radiotherapy such as SBRT for spine metastasis has eliminated the need of aggressive tumor resection, 360 degree tumor resection, allowing the implementation of minimal access in the treatment of spine metastasis. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Vignesh, for sticking to time and being very, very precise. For one to be on time, let me invite one uh, uh, opinion from our uh, uh, president, uh, Dr. Rajkumar Deshpande, sir. So what is a uh, comment on this paper, sir? So uh, it's a nicely uh, written paper. It has certain plus points saying that, you know, Minimal access surgery has a great role to play in spinal metastasis. You have to integrate uh, SBRT. It has to uh, you know, use different kinds of screw fixation itself, sometimes uh, with or without uh, vertebroplasty, maybe kyphoplasty. And uh, I think uh, most of us are following a similar pattern. I think the thing that has differentiated is, I think they have uh, put together a uh, a significant number of patients together to make a nice paper. I am not very sure if there is something uh, which is very new in this. So uh, if anybody found something new, I would like to hear from this. Uh, if their practice is different from any one of you, different. The only thing that uh, I learned probably is that, you know, uh, you might uh, not end up doing a, a big time surgery to excise the lesion itself rather than go for a minimal access technique from the posterior side. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. I think, sir, one of the plus points was that we should not be doing more of uh, uh, kyphoplasty, and, you know, that is probably one of the uh, new information which I saw when I uh, went to it. Uh, for one of time, let me uh, invite our uh, dynamic spine surgeon from uh, Bombay, uh, Dr. Nikhil Arbati, to present his case. Welcome, Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil, can you stop your screen share, please? Sir, already stopped, sir. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank Nikhil, you, can you please start? Thank you you have just... ten minutes. To... Yeah. You have ten minutes to go. Yeah. Okay, there you go, Nikhil. Thanks. Okay, morning, everyone. So today's case is going to be about uh, degenerative lumbar scoliosis. So basically, there are a lot of uh, ways to manage a case of degenerative lumbar scoliosis. And this case is very important for me because uh, based upon this case is how my plan of management in future has changed for this kind of conditions. So just starting with this case, a 60 year old female, she presented with bilateral leg pain with claudication. The distance was about two to five minutes. On examination, the SLR was free, moderate back pain, and there were no neurological deficits. She had taken a lot of analgesics, rest and bracing till now. She had also tried physiotherapy. She had been consulted by other orthopedic surgeons and even a spine surgeon. She had even taken an epidural block once uh, about four or five months before, but none of them had given her a permanent relief. And looking at the radiological pictures, we see the MRI picture. There is a sacralization of the L5 with L3, 4 and 4, 5 stenosis. If you see the uh, axial cuts, the 3, 4 and the 4, 5, they have sagittal oriented facets with facetal arthropathy and phlegm hypertrophy. The MR myeloma. 
mainly the four, five, uh, three, four appear to be the stenotic components. When you see the standing X-ray pictures with the dynamic views, that appear to be mild instability at the four, five level. Mm -hmm. I did a standing AP X-ray, and this is how it appeared with a significant scoliotic coronal tilt. Now. earlier actually to be frank this patient was consulting to me in bombay but she had taken all the treatment in another city and i had advised her all these pictures and upon seeing all this pre op x ray images my line of management had changed appeared a degenerative lumbar scoliosis so what should be the plan for the panels i would like to ask should we do an instrumented decompression and fusion with an open correction all the way from d11 d12 down to l5 or only a symptomatic level st lift mis open or maybe a no lift at the symptom the percutaneous fixation open up the disc spaces and when direct decompression or the other would be a decompression an open laminectomy or a tubular decompression so it's open for all the panels what would be this thing ranjit so uh, can i can i have the opinion of uh, uh, dr amit zala so what would be your opinion in this situation sir Dr. Amit Zala. Okay, can, this is not Nikhil, on. Nikhil, Nikhil, uh, can we get a full length X-ray? Uh, so the X-ray quality of lateral X-ray is not that uh, good to see. In uh, can you go back to the X-ray? Yeah, sorry. So this is the standing uh, lateral X-ray. I haven't got the full length because the place where I advised a full length spine, they were not able to do it. So I got a standing uh, lumbar spine uh, lateral X-ray. This is the standing films. Okay, go to the MRI, please. Like, sagittal and uh, actual MRIs. The sagittal cuts. Okay, from. Uh, uh, my point of view this will definitely require instrumented uh, fusion and decompression if all the conservative measures are failed and the patient uh, like all conservative she was opting for a surgery only uh, she was not looking for any non i mean operative management yeah and uh, and get go to the ap x ray ap x ray yeah the point here uh, point here is there is already a some subluxation which is happening at Maybe uh, four or five. This is four or five level, I suppose. Uh, Sacralized. So what we are saying the last. It's one. a three four. So this is three four. There is some subluxation which is occurring. So I don't think only decompression is a choice here. So you have to go for a fusion, and uh, I don't think D eleven uh, to uh, S one is required it's or required. Uh, pelvic. <clears throat> uh, it's not required at all. So Dr. Zala, uh, three, would you go for direct decompression or indirect decompression? uh because it is sacralized and i cannot see on the actual uh the the whether there is a space available uh, for only for not if it is available definitely i'll go for an indirect decompression and percutaneous okay. fixation that would be my choice if there is a space available at l45 because it's a transition segment sometimes it's a problem thank you sir right, so. uh, dr dr arvind kulkarni what would you offer in this situation dr arvind Yeah, so this patient, if you see the pel, the sacrum is vertical. They uh, try, she's try to compensate a bit here. So if you want to do an instrumented fusion, you really have to think twice because if you do limited fusion, you probably need to go higher up later on. And see, uh, I would go for a selective fusion. And see, my my criteria are two. So along with standing AP, I also need a lying down AP. If there is no much movement in between the two uh, x rays in terms of uh, the corps angle as well as if you see the mri milo you can see you can get a hint as to how the curvature is behaving it's behaving as if it is a uh, uh, it is fixed it is not moving much even in the milo which is done in lying down position so if it is stable in st standing and lying down even on positioning on the on the ot table and if the patient doesn't have back pain i would try a hand at minimal axis decompression but i would have a discussion with the patient that she might if it fails she might need a fusion okay so are you worried about uh, causing instability while during your minimal axis decompression dr arvind so that is uh, uh, you have to be technically a uh, bit uh, uh, you know oriented so see okay. l45 is not a problem at all here it's as good as okay. a normal segment mm -hmm. when you go to l34 i usually go from the convex side so when you go okay. from the convex side the facets are bigger than the concave side 
and you are not destabilizing the concave side which you know which uh, can weaken and increase the tilt so that is something which you have to be very do very calculated decompression when you are uh, operating so you advise that in a degen scoli when you decompress always go from the convex side first that is the point correct uh, not first only uh, so you are doing the over the top so yeah. you are not going on the concave side so concave side the facets there is attrition of the facet joints the lamina are also narrow because of you know uh, uh, chronicity because okay. of attrition so convex okay. side is a big there's a lot of bone there the facets are also big fine so so for want of time uh, uh, nikhil what did you do can you please uh, proceed that proceed okay so basically what i thought was i mean i considered all these options in fact go with the spine no, because now we got we got two uh, varied opinions dr zala wanted to have a instrumented fusion dr kulkarni wanted to have just a decompression so yes. let's you know what you did so for an instrumented fusion i in fact was planning to do an mist lift but then looking at the x ray and all pictures i did uh, decided to do three level tubular uh, decompression no discectomy the main reason why i thought was she had very moderate back pain no difficulty in getting up even with this coronal imbalance she was walking the main problem was she was having claudication pain and even though the facets were sagittal i thought that doing over the top with a tube i would give a proper thorough decompression without destabilizing the facets so right now i did a midline this thing the skin incision with the paraspinal this to the tubes 3 4 4 5 and 2 3 The patient has a long term follow up, almost I mean say long term, but she's been followed up for the last three years. Just once in a year, she sometimes complains of some vague pain, but more or less she has improvement in the walking distance. She has no worsening in the back pain for the last year. She's on a regular follow up, but looking at all these aspects, I thought that doing a decompression has at least relieved her or given her a good time span. And she's just sixty. I mean she's not that uh, very old also. So when I would think if she gets a recurrence and when she would have. required a fusion so i have discussed with her relatives and her and i told her about this plan so that was the main thing but i thought that doing a decompression has at least given her a good longevity and improved the walking distance okay nikhil thanks very much for finishing in time yeah, uh, let me let me invite one ranjit one point yeah so, please uh he is i mean she is uh, it's a good follow up and she's done well but after positioning i would have changed my decision because it's straightening out You know, once the patient is positioned, so that it so makes it dynamic. You would go for a fusion. Ah, so I would yes. have had this discussion prior with the patient. Yeah, exactly. So I was to ask the opinion, uh, Doctor Sudhir Dubey. Doctor Dubey, are you there, sir? Yeah, tell me. Sir, sir, can See, you? See, I won't go for a decompression. I will go for okay. because the claudication in uh, distance doesn't increase uh, significantly in these patients that may become from hundred to four hundred meters. I will okay. go for a two-level O-lif procedure. Means that is a, my procedure of choice for this. Okay, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, uh, Doctor uh, Alok, sir. Alok Rajan, sir. What would be your take on this case, sir? I mean, uh, after seeing the before seeing the patient in uh, operative position, I thought decompression is a good idea, but it's a very good correction once the anesthesia is being given in position. So probably yes, a limited fusion will be a good idea. Fine. So you also would have opted for fusion. So I think uh, Nikhil probably you have to tell us the follow-up of this particular case in no, a very, very long term. Ask, right? I just wanted to know regarding a limited fusion. What about the long term? Won't the adjacent segment start getting a problem? I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you, Nikhil, that there is no perfect answer in this. You are going to bite little bit, little bit in these cases. There is no perfect answer. I have that's realized. That was my concern. That's why I didn't do a limited fusion. You are right, Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil, can you have stop your screen share? And uh, we'll I have one question, the... Ranjit. Can I ask? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, yes, sir. Please, sir. Nikhil, at the end of two or three years, have you got any X-rays done, standing, so we can see what has happened to the? No, no, sir. Actually, I'll tell you something. She is following up with me. I mean, she's in another city, but she just calls me if she has some vague complaints. Otherwise, she is totally happy. She has not come even once to see me after uh, one or two months after the surgery because she says that she's walking comfortably. She's fine, and she can get some X-rays, and that will add some information as time passes. Yeah, we have an opinion from uh, Doctor Vishal Kurnani, but Welcome, she. Has Actually, come with a physical. I am definitely this thing. That's in my it mind. It is rightly said that in degen scoliosis, there is no winning the war. You may win the battle for a while, but the war is still to be coming to you. Degen scoliosis. Okay. I don't think any case we can just generalized and 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 give a blanket treatment to it. 
like can tomorrow Thanks. the next dijon scoli that comes to nikhil or to me or to arvin will we be able to follow the same rules that nikhil followed the answer is no the dijon okay. scoli is one case scenario where every single day you have to tailor make your your plan you have to really consider so many factors which all of us have discussed here including okay. both clinical factors back pain instability radiological factors facet arthritis whether it is seen or not whether you are able to correct it or not whether there is lateral translation or not what are the patient demands how much counseling you yes, order vishal so thank, thank, thank you very much we'll, uh, we'll just take one more opinion and uh, we'll get back uh, dr uh, bala can you have your opinion please yeah i um, i think in this case nikhil's been lucky and if the same case could have come to anybody else he could yes. have ended up with a failure because if you also look at the bone quality it looks very osteoporotic um and you know if you had gone in for instant but i tell you her bone was really very good when i was operating. i mean i had to use a bird i had to use okay. okay 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 so um, so i i think you know as uh, vishal summarized as usual everybody's opinion uh, yeah. you know it's just uh, it's just you know it could have gone out the other way around as well um in this case probably she was you know a, a low performer and not very um, you know aggressive and active and i think she's fine but both answers uh, are right you know you can get away with simple decompression okay. i have you've done similar thank you bala thanks very much uh, and we'll go to the want of time we'll go to the next part of the session thanks very much uh, dr uh, vignesh pushparaj and dr uh, nikhil arbati for the excellent session and we we thank intas for sponsoring this part of the session and next we start the micro micro part of this uh, misa edition uh, we go into the microscopic techniques and let me uh, invite uh, uh dr murli krishna to uh, uh, give his presentation about handling of the microscope good morning dr murli krishna can i have your screen share please dr murli yeah now we able to hear me sir yeah good morning good morning everyone we, yeah yeah please uh, start your screen share, uh, screen share uh, you're not seeing a screen share uh, dr murli yeah okay come you're on okay please go ahead uh, dr murli yeah are you able to see the my screen here Yes, fine. Please, yeah. can please start. Yeah, please. So this is basically a topic about the handling of a surgical microscope. So the surgical microscope has uh, revolutionized the practice of modern spine surgery. The three ma major advantages of the, the system is uh, better illumination, magnification, and the stereoscopic and coaxial vision. So microscope has uh, contributed to the welfare of the surgeon through improved ergonomics. Please, can I interrupt you for a minute? Can, could Sir. you please make it uh, full screen with the play button on top? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Thanks. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. There. So the microscope has uh, contributed to the welfare of the surgeon through improved ergonomics and an opportunity to demonstrate the surgical nuances to the training resident and colleagues in the platforms like this. so for ideal microscope you should have a stereoscopic vision and should have comparatively long working distance the illumination system must evenly illuminate all parts of the surgical field it should be stable enough with articulated balance and it should be able to adapt a wide range of procedures so the basically three primary parts of the microscope are optical system illumination system and stand and suspension arm so the optical system comes with the objective lens which projects an image from the object with a magnification changer so which magnifies or minimizes the image by given factor and the binocular tube head which consists of two telescopes for a stereoscopic vision and adjustable eye pieces are called oculars so the illumination system is uh, uh, present in the floor stand and from there the light is transmitted to the operating field by means of a fiber optic cable so the light is coaxial where it follow the same path as the image the optical system is attached to suspension arm of the floor stand it has wheels that can be moved all around and can be fixed with the brakes so suspension is through gimbal technique which makes system very weightless so this is basically for handling of a Zeiss Tevato 700 microscope the first thing is draping so we should drape the microscope for the purpose of sterility the one important step in draping the microscope is the two handle bars are present on either side of the optical unit there are several buttons for focusing zoom adjustment light intensity change movements for controlling in all directions of microscope so these handle bars should be covered tightly with a drape which allows the proper handling without slipping of the drape or unwanted accidental activation of the controls 
So the balancing, the total weight of the instrument is concentrated at the far end of the horizontal arm with the optics. So it should be counterbalanced with the weights in the inner column of the floor stand. So variations in any equipment or if you are cha have changed the accessories, it changes the weight of the instrument. So it loses its equilibrium and can no longer be used for free moving fashion. So for the trouble free use of free moving operator microscope can be achieved by counterbalancing its weight. So the proper balancing is always essential in order to enjoy the full advantage of free floating microscope. Now this uh, system comes with auto balance system. So rebalancing is always necessary when the configuration of microscope is changed. This system can uh, do the auto balancing within approximately 20 seconds. Coming to handling of microscope, the first thing is turn on the device and release the brakes and microscope should be positioned. So it should be positioned in such a way there is a comfortable working space away from the stand and there should be suspension on, there should be proper overhead clearance and you should have a long working distance where you can easily uh, handle the instruments without damaging the objective lens. So this is basically releasing the brakes and uh, putting the microscope into a comfortable position with, uh, with comfortable working space, overhead clearance and the long working distance. And next comes the fine positioning of the microscope with XY drive on horizontal plane. And the most important thing is adjustment of uh, binocular tube. These are two sets of uh, eyepieces there or ocular, we can call it as oculars. So the correct adjustment of uh, uh, distance of user of surgeon is of great importance for stereoscopic vision and maximum brightness. We have to rotate the knob according to the microscope till you see a, when the two eyepiece images merge into one and it becomes a three dimensional image. Ocular focusing. So each ocular or eyepiece permits a spherical diameter adjustment of minus nine to plus nine. So surgeons with normal vision can set the oculars at zero or surgeons who wear glasses can set the micro microscopic oculars to their individual eyeglass prescription and work without spectacles or they can set that oculars to a zero and can wear glasses and then do the procedure. Well, you have five minutes more. Yeah, eye cups are uh, simply the shades that prevents external light from distracting your vision from entering the microscope. Those who wear glasses, they can uh, curl in the cups. Uh, those who don't wear the glasses, they can keep the eye cups at normal position. So you have to adjust the focus properly so that uh, the image is clear and sharp. You have to zoom. You have to zoom in according to the requirement of the procedure. And increase the light intensity till you're comfortable. So the microscope is set to its highest magnification level above the surgical field, and then it should be focused. So focusing at the highest magnification level leads to perfect focus of all magnification fields. So thereafter, surgeon can only switch to another magnification and does not need to refocus the instrument. The instrument is repositioned, the procedure can be repeated. So our optical fluorescence modes, especially for uh, uh, when you use yellow 569 filter and with the help of low dose sodium fluorescein, the fluorescent dye, the hi it, it highlights the fluorescent stain structures like intraaxial brain tumors or uh, intramedullary spine tumors. And uh, it's an infrared 800 fluorescence based video angiography is especially used for intraoperative assessment of blood flow in aneurysm clipping, AVM bypasses, and anastomosis surgeries. So, rather higher, I mean, Things where you can take the pictures from the integrated camera. So go digital connectivity, uh, where it helps with the user-friendly interface and with the Zeiss Connect app, you can have integrated your hospital infrastructure and through Zeiss Observe app, you can see the real-time streaming of videos in your mobile device. So augmented visualization with navigation where interop pre-operative navigation data is integrated into the live surgical view for better orientation. So in conclusion, it should be stressed that uh, ease of using the microscope during surgery can only be achieved by properly adjusting 
the focusing and balancing the system beforehand. So microscope adjusted according to the procedures noted above will allow the user to work for long periods without fatigue. So if attention is paid to these matters, the surgeon will be able to forget the optical device altogether in course of performing an operation. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Molly. Thank you very much for finishing in time. And uh, so the take home we learned from your talk is that it all depends upon adjusting the focus and the balance and to prevent eye fatigue. Yes. Thank you very much, Molly. Yes. With it, uh, let me invite uh, our Arunab Goswami or our ever charming Dr. Vishal Kulkarni, who is going to teach us in six minutes how to use the microscope which many of us take six years to learn. So knowing Vishal, we can be very sure that we'll have something really good to learn. Welcome, Dr. Vishal. Are visible now? Yeah, Vishal, you are very much visible and audible. Please go ahead. I think, the, I think that the, the, the topic of the talk would be to reduce the learning curve using microscope while doing tubular microendoscopic techniques. And we all know that uh, tubular surgeries have their own learning curve. We have all had problems, at least in the early parts of our career. We have all seen problems that may crop up using these uh, uh, microscopic techniques. And there are new two new things from the conventional open spine surgery. One is the use of microscope, which not only adds to the struggle, but also the learning skills of the surgeon, but also the tube, which narrows down your overall vision. And the third thing is the, the haptic feedback that we generally get because of hand-eye coordination in open surgery is missing. And these three factors, which are completely new to the conventional spine surgeon, increases the learning curve. And these learning curves have been the cause where, where in, in numerous number of problems have been documented. And there are multiple publications in, in, involving the our, our publication, which is recently published in 2020 only, where we have studied the perioperative problems and it has been noted in various studies that the incidence of problems may range from 17 to 19 percent in various studies. And these may be as small as just prolonged surgical time, which, which just means that deviation from the standard uh, timings by experienced surgeons can also be called a problem. So this is just because of the fiddle factor, because of the struggle factor that we have all gone through it. And this adds to the learning curve. Intraoperative bleeding and neural injuries are other issues that have been the, the part of our learning curve. Inadequate decompression can result into an unsatisfied patient. Hydrogenic facet and pars injury either on the same side while doing ipsilateral or contralateral side while you're doing a, overdoing the, the thing. Particularly in patients with developmental canal stenosis, something that can happen. And implant-related issues, of course, is something that has always been a major part of concern when doing MIS surgeries. And all these things have been resulting into a learning curve, which is prolonged for all the evolving surgeons who have evolved from either open surgery into MIS surgery or who are probably trying to take up MIS surgery as the primary part of their practice. Uh, in, in our series of publications that we have gone through, we have been able to dissect why these things happen. Why does a surgeon go through a prolonged surgical time? What is the struggle? What, what makes it to have a surgical time which is prolonged? And what are the other causes of inadequate decompression, bleeding, or neural injury? And we were able to locate from our own learning curves that microscope is one of the factors which leads to not only increased surgical time, but also positioning of the C-arm, getting the true AP, true lateral images, and sometimes preoperative planning issues. And so there are various causes. If you dissect out, these are the things which could have led to an increased surgical time or inadequate decompression or iatrogenic injury or implant-related issues. To broadly sum them all, I think three things that have been really the most important causes of resulting into increased struggle, increased learning curve is the tube docking issues, improper preoperative planning, and also a rush to jump in the ladder of indications of these patients. And just to understand this, how to reduce the problems of tubular spine surgeries, I have reduced, rather than having six tips in six minutes, I have brought it down to five tips in coming five minutes from here. The first tip I will tell is indications. I think the most important aspect, like we have been seeing in the case like Dijon Scoli and other cases, we all must try to understand that those are not the cases to be handled by a novice or a new coming, upcoming MIS surgeon who's getting, getting into the new territory of using a microscope or a tubular surgery. And that is why having the right indication of doing a MIS surgery is extremely important. And for that, you must know the exact source of pain. Remember, on one hand, MIS surgeries can tackle almost all the pathologies, but we also must not forget that MIS surgery is a targeted surgery, and that is why the exact target or the source of pain 
must be known beforehand and you must be absolutely sure about what the exact cause of the pain is whether it's a migrated disc fragment whether it's a facet cyst or it is a exact combination of all these with ligamentum play of hypertrophy with facet with instability or whatever so you must be absolutely sure about the source of pain and your target of surgery should be clearly defined to have a targeted surgery going successful in anybody's hands for that matter so number one know the cause of the symptom and have your indications absolutely right Second point is that in the indication section, we must understand that MIS has its own learning curve. Even the best hand sitting in this panel would agree that we must try to avoid at least in first 50 cases, cases like patients where developmental canal stenosis is present because the, it's the bony narrowing of the canal, which sometimes may become extremely difficult to widen up by doing a tubular surgery. Severe facetal arthritis, you may end up not only either doing inadequate decompression in order to save facet, or you may actually sacrifice the facet resulting into iatrogenic lysthesis or injury in there. And that is why cases like these, multi-level stenosis can not only lead to a surgeon fatigue, but also your skill sets may really have larger volumes of bleeding and the basic principle of MIS may completely get lost. And that is why one must try to follow the ladder in first few hundred cases, try to have maximum number of simplest cases to go on to your ladder from disc to LCS, LCS to TLIF. And once you have done enough number of MIS TLIFs, it's only then time that you may want to venture into the first cervical. So this is the ladder that we all must try to go in. And, and to follow this ladder, I would say even the, before your first live tubular surgery comes in, the, the fiddle factor, even in our own publications, we have mentioned that this fiddle factor is only a matter of time. And that time you should consider to be spending out of the surgical area, out of the surgical OR. And this ladder, by following this ladder, five workshops, 10 videos, 25 lectures, 50 articles, 10 surgeries observed, five assisted, do first on the cadaver. And that's when you are ready. And mind you, the moment you have followed this ladder, you are exactly ready like any of the senior members here. Of course, there will be an early fiddle factor, but the major problems that one faces across in MIS surgeries will really be overcome. And this is the first thing that one can easily overcome, the first part of the learning curve into, into MIS tubular surgeries. The second tip that one must always pay attention to extremely important is that 90% of MIS surgeries happen before the surgery actually begins. And that's what the importance of preoperative planning is. And this cannot be overemphasized. Something that you may pay maximum attention and time to. You not only have to understand that the anatomy of ligamentum flavum is not what is only seen, but also underneath the lamina. You also need to understand the bony anatomy of spinal laminar lines. You have to understand what anomalies of the roots are there <clears throat> and where exactly the targeted nerve root as the source of pain is lying. And all this has to be visualized under the, under the tubular vision. This is something that you must be prepared and you must sit with x-rays, MRIs, and it's not a bad idea to get CT scans done to see the alignment of the facets or pedicle anatomy in the first few hundred cases. You must also not only be aware about the anatomy, but also the pathoanatomy. On one hand, you know exactly know that the radicular symptoms are coming because of the PIVD or the slip disc, but you also must try to find out exactly where this fragment is lying. Has it migrated above, migrated below, or if the facet cyst is the cause of my pain, where exactly is there? How do I am planning to reach there? Is it the end on view on the facet cyst or I'm going to come obliquely from the other side? All these points have to be taken into consideration. And as I said, 90% of MIS surgery should happen even before you wash up for the surgery in these patients. After having known your anatomy, Having known your pathoanatomy, it's extremely important to understand if there is any variation in the anatomy. A bent spinous process or just a mild tilt in the spinous process may make your surgery completely a mess. Why? Because your tube going on the sides of the, of the spinous process, which is the side is bent to, can exactly lead to a tilt of the tube completely getting laterally shifted, resulting into a facet injury. And so these small deviations into anatomy can easily be noted on a MRI axial scan, where not only you can see the orientation of the facet, because a vertically oriented facet, you take off even a partial one third of it and the facet is completely gone. You put a tube on the side where the spinous process is tilted, your tube can completely get tilted away. And also the disc migration where exactly it is placed. All these factors along with like Dijon's Coley patients is something that must be kept in mind where your tube is going to go sit there. And as I mentioned, it is the tube docking issues which can easily be overcome by pre-operative planning. This is something that one must pay gross attention to before surgery. Neural anomalies have recently been paid so much more attention because it is not so uncommon to note that while you're doing a tubular surgery, sometimes you may not be able to reach the lateral aspect of the neural equator. This is something that can easily be picked up on MR neurographies also and also on detailed evaluation of MR scans is something that is very important because if you're trying to remove a disc fragment in a, in a patient with a neural anomaly, you may end up retracting the nerve root more because of the limiting vision and that's why something that you may want to uh, learn. We shall, we shall three minutes more. Three minutes more. Either you can just fuse it or, or you can do it from the contralateral side. 
and remember all these anatomical points that you have learned and, and evaluated on preoperative scan has to be merged on the radiological anatomy ultimately mis is all about radiological surgery it is based on cm and that's why all these points have to be correlated with the radiological anatomy that you're going to see intraoperatively equipment cm and positioning has always been a matter that can initially struggle you but the moment you are getting ready with this and you have all the equipments ready we learned about the microscopic factor the cm remember having a true ap and true lateral is the most basic thing and having an oblique end plate like this is something that you may want to avoid whether you are doing a tube docking or you are doing a fixation and all these have been causes of reduced reliability of cms and superior facet violation that have been happening and we have published this extensively in our studies there long instruments different kind of instruments you may want to get used to all of these having proper dilators different dilators and a very very flexible arm attached to the table is something that you may want to keep ready even before your incision comes in and any of these factors which are not present on your ot table can actually result your surgery going very very long and the struggle factor may just magnify exponentially and that's why you have all these instruments get used to these instruments in open open surgeries before you jump into your mi surgery and this is something a small a long cautery tip if you don't have it on your table your tibular surgery may be a mess and you may really be struggling with it and this is something that you may want to check pre operatively whether it is there or not different type of bolsters have been then but the basic principle of protecting the bony prominences and keeping abdomen free cannot be over emphasized one thing very important is that in a mi surgery you may want to tilt the patient one the other side which may result the patient tilting to the others and that's why keeping the patient strapped to the table is extremely important one must pay attention to tube docking lessons i think we are going to be seeing some videos on here but tube docking is the one thing that has created maximum number of struggle maximum amount of struggle in these patients and that is why we must pay attention not only to anatomy remember that facet arthritis like in nikhil's case there was a significant facet arthritis the tube docking may not go all the way to the bone and muscle hang and the creeping of the muscles in the tube can really result into increased surgical time one must pay attention to this avoid getting guide wires there incision should go all the way from skin to the fascia don't uh, be a miser in putting an incision on the fascia there uh, getting the tube incision right when you are doing fusion which is little lateral compared to the decompression is something very important to avoid overhang and get the proper length of the tube very important this bony uh, mark spinal laminal line is something that you may always want to pay attention to because this is the place where your most of the tubes for decompression fusion set in and this is something that you may pay attention to getting the right alignment of the tube is something that we all upon based upon earlier however getting the tube bang in the line with the disc is extremely important and if you are doing multi level through the same incision remember that your tube has to be always in the line with the disc if you want to go into a discectomy or decompression of the traversing nerve root and this is something that we may pay uh, must pay attention to always and as i just emphasized knowing your exact pathology where it has migrated will also help you determine the right angulation of the tube and this is something that we may must pay attention to pre operatively and last but not the least the meticulous technique of doing over the top decompression cannot be over emphasized uh, try to preserve the ligamentum plavum till the end till your bony work is completely over remember the soft tissue work of removing ligamentum plavum this only starts once you are done proper hemi laminotomy uh, on the ipsilateral side on the opposite side and preserve the ligamentum plavum don't be in a rush to remove the ligamentum plavum even before you have gone to the other side and once you are done the bony work going under the spinous process only then you should start removing the ligamentum plavum I've seen juniors removing the ligamentum plavum early, and that leads not only to bleeding, uh, disturbing their vision. Also, neural injuries can happen, and that's why preserve the ligamentum plavum till your bony work is completely over on the other side. Try to keep all the bony landmarks like parts on ipsilateral side and facet on the other side under your vision. And blind bitings is something that's a strict no-no, which can easily happen if your muscle is creeping regularly. So try to have a, a minimum amount of overhang. Get your tube properly docked and deep inside on the bone, so that there is no muscle overhang to create a, a blind bite for you. This is something that you must avoid. And remember, hemostasis is a habit. It's not a skill. You have to really start right from skin to fascia to muscle through the tube. There is no amount of bleeding that is permissible while you are doing your soft tissue neural work there. because any bite in the vision of presence of bleeding can be a blind bite resulting into dural tears and resulting we, with vishal you have to wind up the yes, time is up uh, summary so how do we reduce problems in tubular surgery i think the best thing is to choose the right patient plan your surgery absolutely in advance pay detailed attention to pre operative planning do your surgery before you wash up for the surgery prepare for the surgery with your equipments pay detailed attention to your positioning and also strap these patients tube docking principles are not new are mentioned in detail in literature however Uh, planning and paying some attention on cadavers or even on soft tissue hands on uh, uh, can really reduce the learning curve about tube docking principle and remember over the top decompression has certain rules to follow follow them and you will be ready to do it like a master thank you so much
Thank you, Vishal. Thanks very much. You know, so we can, you know, we saw that even after the master told the expert time, expert tips, we still take more time to master the technique. For want of time, we'll go to the next part of the session, which actually is very, very interesting. You know, we have got six expert uh, minimal hypnosis spine surgeons from six parts of the country, from six states, going to tell us in six minutes how they will demonstrate the interesting tips in doing complex situations in minimally invasive uh, spine surgery. Let me invite uh, Dr. Alok Rinchen to start off with his first talk on interesting techniques in MI surgery. Uh, Dr. Alok, please. So can you unmute and share your screen, sir? Yes. Can, sir, you, can you share your now? screen, sir? Yes, sir. You're very much audible. Can, we see your, can you share your screen, sir? I'm sharing my screen. Is it coming? No. No, sir. You're still seeing you. Oh. OK. Okay, my friends, just wait. Why are you disappearing here? Hey. Sir, uh, hold it. Neeraj, anything from that side you can do to? Sharing screen? No, can sir, you... still not yet. Not yet. Not yet. We are still seeing you. Sharing? Yes. Yes. Now you're starting, sir. Now I'm sure. To... Where the hell is my you video? Have... You, see the you, have to take the, you have to take your screen which you want, to, want to show us. Yes. Are you able to see? Yes, sir. Right. This, this is a video case, case, case with the video. One second, I'm restarting. Okay. So MRI scan shows L34, right side disc prolapse, symptomatic. I generally put a needle to mark from the contractual side. I don't use a K wire to go all the way. I just use K wire to go to fascia. Then the dilators are used. The needle on the other side, I remove it because that gives me guidance so that I reduce the x-ray. As you keep putting the tube, you keep uh, dissecting off the tissue. Ideally, the tube, which is 16 millimeters, should be touching the skin, but I did not have the right size for that. Final laminar line is established. That is the medial. This is the inferior. This is the superior. And this is the lateral. There is a spinal laminar line. We are just removing, doing a laminotomy. You may or may not require, depending on where your pathology is, but this is just for demonstration purpose. There is a ligamentum flavum. This is where I put near the parts to know how far I am from the parts. I just use a simple dissector. And sometimes I use knife, sometimes dissector and use a carison to remove bit by bit. You can do all the ligamentum flavor exposure going by doing a big laminotomy is up to your choice. That is a fact we can see. We can see the fat. That is a fat on top of dura. Idea is to go to the lateral margin of the nerve root. There's no point retracting in this position. You must go to the lateral margin of the nerve root without damaging the facet. Still to reach, so I take a little bit more. Now I can see the lateral margin. I can see the pars, so facet, very important to preserve the facet. Bipolar coagulation, that is a big disc prolapse. It is a little long standing disc prolapse. Generally, it comes out in one big piece. In this case, I had to struggle. It was coming out in small, small pieces. This is a inferiorly migrated fragment. Generally, the whole fragment comes out if it is a fresh one, if it is a very long one. In this case, the history was longer. It became uh, difficult to remove in one fragment. Some bleeding comes. If you have a good, decent bleeding, it means you have decompressed the nerve root. We are trying to use a dissector. You can use the instrument of your choice. See the dilated vein there. That area. On laterally, there is nothing but the pedicle.
this kind of bleeding can happen. Need not panic. Okay. Here again, I feel, make sure that all the fragments are out. I will not do this for the exiting nerve root because the ganglion gets inflamed. This is the traversing nerve root. You are safe. If the bleeding happens, just put a gel foam there for some time and a patty and the bleeding will stop. In this case, just for the demonstration purpose, I have gone to expose the disc space, which is much, much higher. I just, that is the axilla. Just to feel in axilla, there is nothing. So I've just gone to expose. You don't need to always remove the disc in these cases. The tube being used is 16 millimeter. In 14 millimeter, you cannot use drill. In 16 millimeter, you require high skill to use drill. And if you are going to use drill, I prefer 18 millimeter because you do not want a bigger, bigger injury. This was almost like an osteophytic disc. I just wrap the fat towards this. This is what you get. The muscle layers, virgin muscle layers closing down. Stitches, not my stitches, my junior stitches. This is the post-op. Generally, I don't do post-op films, but in this case, for the demonstration purpose, the fragment has been removed. This is what we get, entry point and exit point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the excellent demonstration, excellent video skills with your uh, tubular discectomy. Let me uh, list, uh, next have, uh, we have uh, Dr. Amit Zala uh, to have uh, his uh, talk. Dr. Zala, can you please uh, share your screen, sir? Yes. Uh, uh, Alok, sir, can you please uh, stop sharing and stop? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Dr. Zala, can, you, can we have you on? Okay, sir. Thank you very much. So I'm going to present uh, the case of an extra foraminal disc. And you all know that if you go from a midline to the extra foraminal disc, then you have to damage the facet joint. And if this particular discectomy is one of the best way to do this extra foraminal uh, disc where you just preserve the muscles and there is no instability which is uh, created and it's more of a classical extended Wilsey's approach. We'll say use the retractor but this is a tubular retractor which is very very nice uh, in retracting uh, compared to the uh, uh, classical retractors. So tubular retractor is one of the best indications for extra foraminal disc Usually the extrafloral disc is lying uh, lateral to the facet joint. That is where the extrafloral disc would be there. So uh, the patient is usually prone, uh, is in a prone position. The incision is marked around three to four centimeters lateral uh, to the spinous process. And uh, what I would do is actually uh, tilt the tube around 20 to 30 degree, tilt the CM around 20 to 30 degree. See this part. Once you see this part and then I put in the needle there and the docking is usually at the angle of the transverse process and the superior facet. So this, this angle is very beautifully seen uh, in 20 to 30 degree tilted uh, uh, C arm position. So this is where I see this, uh, see this, see this angle and then I mark uh, uh, with the help of the needle. And now that video starts. So, So you can see that uh, this is where it is around uh, three or four centimeters far lateral to the midline. It's not around the same where the routine tubular discectomy is done. The far lateral, you have to go around three to four centimeters lateral to the uh, midline. So once uh, the tube is docked, the tube is docked at this point, as I said, that's the transverse process and that's the lateral part of the facet joint. So this is exactly where the tube is docked and this docking point is very important. If you don't have this docking point, you are going to fumble throughout the surgery. So I take, and this is what uh, usually uh, the docking point is in the model. You can see usually the root comes from here. This is the exiting root. 
and you are docking to the inferior transverse process and the facet joint. You cannot dock it here because then you will be directly at the uh, uh, exiting root. So you, uh, you dock at the transverse process facet junction uh, of the inferior side. So this is, a, this is a how it, the docking is done. So once you have uh, docked, what you will be able to see here, so this is what you actually see. This is where is the transverse process. This is where is the facet joint. And this is the uh, part where there is a disc. Okay. So this is superior, this is inferior, this is medial, and this is lateral. So that's the orientation. And you can very well see the. Uh, you can very well see this is the angle of the superior facet and the transverse process junction. So that's the facet joint. If this was slightly foraminal to extra foraminal. So I just uh, removed with the help of, you can use a burr or you can use a kerosin and remove the lateral part of the uh, superior facet to get a good access to the foramen. So I just removed a little bit of the lateral part of the bone of the superior facet here. So once you, uh, you are there, there is usually a bleeder there. So it's always better to dissect uh, with help and coagulate that bleeders which come at the angle at this angle preemptively. And then once you explore there, this is one of the safest zone where you don't damage the exceeding nerve root. And that's the disc which is there. And that's a high magnification now. Once we have dissected that. So two minutes more. Yeah. With the help, you can use a knife, uh, make a cut in the disc, annular cut, or you can use a, a pen fill. Use a probe or a hook, whatever your choice, to enlarge the incision or to milk out the disc if it comes out first. Usually, you don't see the exiting root here initially because the exiting root is shifted upwards, and you are going to actually see the root. that's the disc fragment which has come out. The exiting root will be embedded somewhere in the fibro fatty tissue there on this side. And this is where the disc is. So once you have removed. You can use the an angle uh, to go inside the uh, foramen. You can see that's the root. That is the root which is embedded in the fibro fatty tissue. Yeah. So that is a root. And you can see it's easily retractable now. And you can see that's the exiting root. And this is where the discectomy was done. Again, a big fragment coming out. That's clearly showing the exiting root and the disc which is removed there. Okay, so you can palp it and see in CM also how much far medial and how much far superior you have gone to check exactly the decompression and that is the uh, incision. Uh, okay, thank sir. You. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much for the excellent session. Now, let me invite uh, Dr. Sudhir Dubey to uh, make his presentation on his uh, tip on minimally invasive spine surgery. Uh, can you uh, stop sharing, uh, Dr. Zala? And stop, thank you, sir. And Dr. Dubey, can we have you on, sir? Dr. Sudhir Dubey? Yeah. Yes, sir, please. Can we, uh, can we see your uh, screen share? Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yes, sir, we can see you. Can you please start? 
Yes, so this is a case of a L1 fracture. You can see a bone fragment which is going into the spinal canal. This is a CT and this is a port which we have gone and we have docked on the side where the transverse process and the facet junction is there. We are going from lateral to medial and uh, the junction where exactly the facet joint and the transverse process is there, we start our drilling. And uh, it's a lot of drilling and you have to have a safety in this form that medially you will have the uh, ligament and then you will have the nerve root. At L1, you will have the terminal part of the spinal cord, which will be there. So position, we have to we do x-rays or you use a navigation probe and then you can exactly know where your trajectory is there. You aim for that junction, which I showed on the navigation films. And then you know that you are going inside the body, so you can go deep inside. You know that this area is the area where your dural tube will be there. So once you are inside the body, you are safe. You can drill more safely. And you can look at uh, things. Then you have to look at the disc above and the disc below, which is there. And uh, because it's a corpectomy, so you will have this thing. So this is the L1 body entry, which we have made. This is the part of the dural tube, which is there. Now, as we go superiorly, we are going to find the disc, the T12 L1 disc. And as you go inferiorly, you are going to find the disc below. Because you are doing going to do an interbody fusion. So you have to make sure that you have taken out the disc because then only the fusion will occur and you have prepared the end plates properly. And this is the distal thing. Now distally, what you can see is the nerve root will be coming here at this level with the vessels. You can see a part of the nerve root. So what you can see is a burr is below that. It is not above it. So that much uh, sense of space you should have when you do that. And then you do the caudal discectomy, which is there. The caudal discectomy ensures that you have uh, removed all the disc and uh, the bone is removed. Now, this is the dural tube. This part of the bone we had saved, which is projecting inside. So this is the bone. This you separate gradually from the dura, the bone fragment. Because you have drilled most of it, it is loose now. It is not very strong. So with small uh, downward angle curates. You can gradually push it down. And because it's an old uh, fracture, so you will see that uh, there is a lot of fibrosis around. Normally, there is not so much here, but it's a whole heal this thing. So you can see a lot of degenerative tissue, which is there. Until you have removed this decompression, uh, you won't get a, this thing. So that is always there. And this is... Uh, not towards our side, then sometimes we use a uh, hammer also to push it down, the fragment down. So now it has come down, it has come safely down inside and you have delivered it down. And the cord will be lying on somewhere on that side. So it is quite far off and it is protected because you are angled view. So you will, you will have a tendency to save it properly. So that is what we are doing, that pushing the final fragment down. It takes a uh, patient at this stage. We also use an endoscope, cranial endoscope to take this fragment down. And so now you can see that it is now lax. And there was a dural tear in this case, a part of the dura got this thing. So uh, we put a dura gen. So it was the root which was getting exposed. Then we removed all of this on the side. And the leakage is pretty much not there. And it never causes post-op leak to that much extent. And then after we have to insert a cage. So we have made, in this case, you make a space enough. And you go inside and put a cage. And once your cage is properly fashioned, you can open it. It's an expandable cage. You will reinforce whatever, uh, uh, again, because while putting the cage inside, the duraform slipped. So I just put another duraform at this place. And this is how it is in the post-operative time that it looks like. This is a cage area. 
on the sides you will see that uh, we do update a percutaneous uh, fixation with this thank you for your attention thank you sir thank you very much for for taking in time let us uh, next have uh, dr vikas gupte uh, dr vikas gupte uh, another uh, excellent spine surgeon pioneer from uh, from bombay dr vikas can we have your screen share please sir so in while dr gupte is getting ready we, i uh, wish to thank uh, zayas on behalf of uh, misab for sponsoring this uh, this excellent yeah, uh, uh, session uh please uh, dr vikas yeah this is for case of minimal invasive tilt done for degenerated disc positioning uh, is prone position i usually mark my surface marking of the pedicles uh, uh before surgery so that uh, my uh, needle passage is very easy said so, cooks bone perhaps the needle is passed guide wire is passed i passed guide wire in all four pedicles all four pedicles guide wire is passed then pass the pedicle screws on the opposite side if i am operating from the left side i i pass pedicle screws on the right side uh, right side first and then come on the operative side i take a skin incision subcut and then mark my entry point using a guide wire or a guide wire serial tubes are passed and i usually use 22 mm tube fixed tube no quadrant and tube is fixed with a plexi arm muscle creep is cleared and using a microscope this is the passage joint so i'll just orient it. this is a passage joint see this is a inferior facet that's a superior facet this is leg side this is head side i uh, do all my dissection using microscope i don't use uh, osteotom for facetectomy because i believe that with microscope and with carison uh, your dissection is much easier and you know what you are cutting how much you you want to cut how much you want to remove that is all controlled inferior facet is removed so what you see now is superior facet and ligamentum flavum i separate ligamentum flavum from the superior facet and in pair lamina that's a yellow ligament and then gradually remove the superior facet till pedicle margins you can see the pedicle margins so if superior facet is removed till pedicle margins remove ligamentum flavum achieve a hemostasis that's the dural tube you can see dural and root you can see and on side where i am coagulating is the disc space disc
so you need not touch dural area you are you are retract it very gently no handling of the dura make a anatomy and disc preparation which is a most important uh, step in any fusion surgery thorough disc preparation put a sizer put autologous uh, local bone graft which are collected that cage is filled with a local bone graft and remaining bone grafts are put into anterior space disc space using a funnel cage is filled with the bone graft and put into the thing hemostasis is achieved that's the cage sir so 30 seconds more yeah done fix the pedicle screws that's it thank you thank you sir thank you thank you dr gupte for an excellent demonstration next uh, let me invite uh, dr bala murli from chennai uh, dr bala can we have you on Thank you very much, Bala. Please go ahead. Bala, we cannot hear you. Doctor Bala. Doctor Bala, are you talking? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, fine. We can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. We can hear you. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, so I'm going to talk about minimally invasive approaches to the intradural tumors. So I'm going to compare open versus minimally invasive. When we're doing an open intradural tumor, you do a wide laminectomy for multiple levels. I mean, if you, as the patient is more obese, you have to do a much more wider laminectomy, and then you do a dural opening, and it's a well-known standard procedure. Neurosurgeons are used to. um and you can do a very minimal damage control but still there is a lot of risks associated with open surgery as you can see for this tumor you have to do quite a wide opening um and you have to probably destabilize it a little bit um and you have the risk of bleeding a uh, longer dural opening and so various other uh, problems associated uh, with opening surgery with an open surgery so i'm uh, i'm just going to now see uh, how you can compare a very similar tumor uh, which was operated uh, open um, how you can do it minimally invasive where in the minimally invasive you are going to approach is slightly more lateral your bony opening is slightly different so the techniques here what we are going to use is the same tubular i'm not going to show about docking but i use an expandable uh, retractor where you can actually expand quite a way outside up to one or two levels so you can approach tumors up to two vertebral body levels uh, with an expandable uh, tube so i have done schwannomas meningiomas astrocytomas here's an example of a 38 year old male who presented was under follow up been want surgery but eventually he he had cauda equina uh, this was at the level of um, um, l1 um, and so here you can see it's docked through a tube uh, we exposed dura um and um you do an intracapsular so you are going within the tumor you're decompressing the tumor um and you're slowly releasing it from the outside so neurofibroma and you can see that you can very beautifully take it out uh, the important thing is dural closure many people worry that you know you can't get achieve a dural closure like you would do with an open surgery but it's definitely not true with experience the way you handle your needle if you are very good you can very nicely get an an absolutely watertight closure it's a small opening a patient goes home in 24 hours a similar tumor a schwannoma where you can see it was quite a large lesion 
um, which was causing significant neural deficits in this patient. Again, a young chap, um, where you go in and you slowly kind of shrink the tumor. Um, and then you, you know, you pass a needle, you can use different techniques. I was not able to deliver it very easily. I was trying to put a lot of pressure on the nerves. So I just put a small stitch on it and just gradually you pull it up and it comes out. Um, and then you see the uh, rootlets, which are there. You cannot separate the rootlets in this case. It's just completely engulfed the schwannoma. Um, so you need to identify the exact rootlets. Uh, you can use neuromonitoring for these cases. Uh, but once you're doing at the lower levels, you probably don't. It's not going to make much difference, unlike in the cord level. Um, and then you just uh, buzz the rootlets and, and the root from where it's arising uh, and remove it. And you're going to be still able to uh, uh, take this out successfully. Um, and then again, there's your uh, the tumors delivered. Um, watertight closure is very important. Um, and in case you're not comfortable and you're not happy that you're getting a watertight uh, closure um, and you, you, could, you could probably try and use clips. There are clips available. They are um, magnetic resistant as well, MRI compatible uh, clips. Um, so I use this needle uh, holder with a uh, knot pusher where you can get it really watertight. Um, and it is very important, though the tube opening is small, unlike when you do a discectomy, um, here you are doing quite a wide exposure. There is a dead space available. Um, so you can use uh, tissue glue. So I'm using a seal here. Um, I was still happy, but, you know, I was a little bit concerned about this patient. It was a very obese patient. Um, so I thought I'd rather use, but majority of times I don't use uh, uh, dural seal. And just for the sake of this, I'm showing you one of those cases. Um, and then it's again, a patient walks home in 24, 48 hours. Uh, they do very well. Another large tumor, uh, which initially I was contemplating about whether I should do this minimally invasive or open. Um, well, again, I thought that let's, let's do it through MIS. Um, so these are not cases where whether you're a neurosurgeon or as an orthopedic trained surgeon in neurosurgery who does tumors, it, it takes a lot of time because you have all these neural structures as you can see around, but you need to know how you're gonna handle these neural structures. Um, so it's very important that you take time, decompress it here. You don't need to remove these tumors in one piece. So you go inside intracapsular, you debulk the tumor, you remove the tumor as much as you can. So I'm just showing a very simple variety of these tumors. Uh, you can do a much more complex, which I, I really don't want to show for this audience, um, where you can go and remove very large um, neurofibromas, both intradural uh, and extradural. Um, and these are like giant schwannomas, dumbbell schwannomas. You can even remove them by slightly tilting your microscope away. And you can then go into uh, interpedicle. You can remove the part, the intra uh, canalicular part, and then you can go extra dural uh, as well and you can remove the component which is there um, so so it is possible to operate a lot of these tumors up to one or two levels and and i've also reported cases we have done multiple levels through two or three separate um, ports um, you can open um, so it is possible learning curve is there safety is very important the 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 eventual idea should be is you should not destabilize the spine a lot of advantages which mis has for tumors as well. But the ideal goal is that at the end of the procedure, you should be able to completely resect the tumor. If you're not able to completely resect the tumor, do not go into this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bala. Thanks very much to be precisely finishing on time. So to uh, conclude the six minute, six smart surgeons, six city series, let us invite the master blaster from uh, Bangalore, Dr. Umesh Rikanta. Can you have, can you have you, Dr. Umesh? Dr. Umesh Rikanta. Yeah, 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 Dr. Ranjit, hi. Yeah, please, Umesh, can we have your uh, a screen share, please? Yeah, uh, so originally I was supposed to present uh, the over-the-top decompression, but uh, just to keep in sequence, uh, should I present something uh, on tumors or should I go back in... Uh... I think probably you can do over-the-top because that will stick to our protocol. Okay. Thanks, Umesh. Yeah, so this is a simple straightforward case, an L45 canal stenosis, which we decided to do a over-the-top decompression. 
Um, so probably long-standing neurogenic lodication patient presented to it acutely because of the soft fragment, acute fragment that is there. So the approach was obviously right-sided because of the right radiculopathy you know, that the patient presented with. So I think incision and docking has already been discussed in detail in several sessions. So basically for UBF, for over-the-top decompression, we dock it a little higher than usual, more on the lamina just to reach the top edge of the ligamentum flavum attachment and in order to remove the ligamentum flavum completely. So sequential docking is done, then appropriate size uh, length tube is selected. This is an 18 millimeter size tube for a decompression. Uh, appropriate length is selected and then is fixed to a bed rail clamp as usual. So this is the first visualization that we should get. The lower border of the lamen and the upper border of the interlaminar space. Obviously, this doesn't cover the entire area that we need to decompress. We identify the medial lateral. The lateral aspect should be extended up to the medial border of the facet joint. The facet capsule should be preserved as, as, as much as possible. A small hemilaminotomy is done. And then the upper part of the hemilaminotomy, the, under the uh, lamina, we can actually trace the border of the ligamentum flavum and we can make that area free and pull the ligamentum flavum down. And then laterally, we can work on top of the uh, lateral edge of the dura and as well as the traversing nerve root in order to extend down down that is the lateral edge of the dura that is on the beginning of the nerve root that we are seeing there so usually in order to preserve more of the facet joint we are using this curved arcarisons more and more these days so this is basically to preserve the facet joint do more of an undercutting job rather than you know removing the facet in order to visualize the lateral flange of the ligamentum flavum so once that is done then we have to move the tube inferiorly in order to visualize the lower part of the de decompression procedure that is the upper border of the lower lamina so there we dissect and that is the upper border of the lower lamina being drilled and we can identify the lower attachment of the ligamentum flavum the lower attachment of the ligamentum flavum can be made free and then we can use an upcut in order to remove the ligamentum flavum over the traversing nerve root as well as the medial lip of the superarticula process in order to achieve a complete decompression and even in these cases whenever there is a medial hypertrophic superior lip without compromising the facet integrity we can actually uh, significantly, we can actually remove the uh, over, overhanging part of the supraarticular process using a curved kerosene. So this is an acute fragment that was removed in this case. I'll just skip this part. You know, and that is a discectomy that was be, that was done for this. So once the ipsilateral decompression is completed, then we angulate the tube to the contralateral side in order to visualize the inner cortex of the contralateral lamina. So that the procedure that is called as a contralateral internal laminectomy, you don't have to remove the complete lamina on the opposite side. And once we remove the base of the spinous process, that is how our drill is going to work. The ligamentum flavum on the opposite side is still preserved. So that is why our drill goes in between the inner, inner uh, cortex of the lamina and the ligamentum flavum all the way up to the facet joint. And then we can, remove the facet joint which is almost free by that time only the lateral attachment will be preserved so and then we can go all the way lateral into the contralateral lateral process and then remove the ligamentum from its attachment the same way that we had done on the ipsilateral side we have to go on the contralateral side to the upper edge of the lower lamina uh, and then we can remove the ligamentum flavum from that part as well so once the contralateral decompression is completed so that is again a residual ligamentum flavum that is being removed from the opposite side that is just under the superarticular process. So that is the contralateral nerve root. It is important to decompress the contralateral nerve root axilla, the traversing nerve root axilla as well, because that is one thing that usually is not, uh, uh, you know, sometimes we might fail to address that in the initial stages. So that is the contralateral nerve root after the decompression is, uh, is completed. So basically just to uh, re-emphasize, so that is once the complete decompression is come. So just to re-emphasize, so this is the, four quadrant approach that we commonly say. So ipsilateral initially because of the tube size, 18 millimeter covers this much of this one. So if we have to re remove the upper edge of the ligamentum flavum and as well as decompress the lateral edge of the dura, angulate the tube inferiorly and then decompress the traversing nerve root all the way up to its foramen as well as remove the lo up lower attachment of the ligamentum flavum. And then turn the tube contralaterally and the similar uh, approach has to be done on the contralateral side, thus ensuring uh, complete ligamentum removal, both ipsilateral as well as contralateral side. And so this is how a post-operative uh, MRI is going to look. So after removing uh, ipsilateral and contralateral decompression. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, uh, Umesh. As crisp and precise as ever, thanks very much. And thanks for taking in time. So with this, we conclude the six surgeon, six minutes, six master series. And uh, thanks very much, Azayas, for sponsoring the session.
and with this let me invite our uh, uh, always a uh, trend setter uh, pioneer surgeon uh, and our president of misab dr rajkumar deshpande to uh, give his presentation on microscope in modern spine surgery so most of us know that dr deshpande is a pioneer as a trend setter in most of the things so you have all anything new in technology in spine surgery it has to be dr deshpande so let us hear what sir has to tell us today on his uh, roundup of the session. Dr. Deshpande, please. Can we have your uh, uh, screen share, sir? Thank you, sir, please. Thank you, Ranjit, for a very nice and elaborate uh, description of what I do. But let me tell you, I'm just a plain and simple spine surgeon like any one of you. I work as hard as you guys do. Only thing is I had to work harder because you guys are far more skilled and far more intelligent and far more uh, capable than many of us are. So with that, uh, uh, let me go to the uh, topic. The topic is microscope in modern spine surgery. And my uh, talk is not going to be for experts who just poke. This is for young spine surgeons who are gravitating uh, from open surgery to minimal access surgery. And therefore they start using the microscope. So many of them use the microscope without knowing much about what the microscope is. My young colleague, Dr. Murli explained some uh, things about microscope today. And let me add uh, a few things around the microscope so you can understand where and when we have to use microscope. So the advancement in surgical access or instrumentation bros, uh, actually progressed from naked eye surgery. All of us learned surgery using our eyes. And then you know we started using the loops get some fixed magnification. Then you started doing microscope assisted surgery, either open or MIS. Then you now added endoscope assisted surgery. And now you have a combination of exoscope, microscope, endoscope, all coming in together to give us improved visualization. So if you compare loops and microscope, there are a great set of uh, similarities and differentiations. For example, in a, the magnification in a loop is very limited and the range is limited. You can't focus, you can't defocus unless you move your head up and down. Whereas in the microscope, since the range uh, is uh, uh, changeable, the focal points can change from a height uh, of just a you know, near distance and a far distance. And it can be changed during surgery. Now, whenever you want to do all this with the neck, you end up having a neck pain over a period of time. That's one of the major disadvantages of loops. And many of the cardiac surgeons who are very used to loops, uh, many of the plastic surgeons, they end up consulting neurosurgeons for their longstanding neck pains. Therefore, uh, when you are using uh, loops, there's a set of uh, disadvantage that happens. Uh, obviously, both get 3D vision because you're using uh, two parallel uh, visual axis and you know, the brain beautifully collapsed both of them to make a 3D vision. One of the difficulties of a loop is you can't teach very well to associates because the associate can't see what you're doing and what they see and what you're seeing may not be the same. Therefore, I think there are certain advantages of loops. You can use it for short surgeries. Uh, your individual surgeon, you don't know, I uh, don't want to teach, I don't have the capability at that time where you're operating. So I think loops are useful, but for longer procedures, I would rather end up using a microscope. So this is how the position of a, a surgeon using a loop and assistant, and then you can see the difference between uh, a surgeon who is operating on the assistant who can assist. So they're seeing exactly the same thing, almost the same thing. Uh, so I feel that understanding microscope uh, came to us from pioneers when uh, Professor Kurz, Kurz uh, 1957, uh, became the first neurosurgeon to use and we had the great Ghazi, Azargil and Donaghi using it in 58. Now, uh, uh, many of the orthopedic surgeons do not know who is Azargil. Azargil is a pioneer neurosurgeon from Turkey who migrated to Switzerland, trained in America but uh, became one of the uh, fathers of macular surgery in the second half of last century for his great contributions to brain surgery, including spine surgery. He was the first surgeon to do a microscopic discectomy, just to let you know. So this is the 
uh, one of the oldest uh, microscope uh, that was ever designed, the first microscope by Zacharias and Hans Janssen in 1590. So Zeiss were the pioneers and other companies do nowadays. And I'm going to show uh, what is it that you should understand about microscope that make it so beautiful for surgeons to use. My friend Muruli has already spoken about the optical system, the illumination system, suspension, video system, documentation. The whole idea is the more you can see, the better you are able to treat. So basically you have to have a high degree of safety and control on what you see and where you see. And therefore, good illumination, magnification, which is variable, all this will actually make your patients do better. So microscopes give a three-dimensional magnification, illumination, et cetera, et cetera. The whole list of advantages. The, one of the things that you must understand is for specific uh, therapies, treatment, whether it is brain or spine, you need additional microsurgical instruments. And to learn to use this microsurgical uh, instrumentation is an art and is a continuous process. And over time, you are bigger and bigger incisions automatically tend to become smaller and smaller because you are seeing better at a depth and the surface uh, as you progress. So how do you practice microsurgery? This is not a big teaching class for microsurgery, so I'm not going to teach all the steps, step by step. But the first thing you have to have is eye-hand coordination. Surgeons who have never used microscope, suddenly you start using the microscope, you find that they do not move as well. You have to learn to sit in an ergonomic position. Young surgeons who are around 25, 30, 35 years, they should understand there are 30 years ahead of them to practice surgery and their art. And therefore, if they actually spoil their back or neck, they'll have problems. So, Learn to sit in an ergonomic position or stand in an ergonomic position. Support forearms and wrist while you operate so the shake is minified. As you understand, as you extend the arms, you start having some mild tremors. Therefore, you should sort of support the arms, uh, forearms and wrists very nicely so that your hand becomes very steady. And then normally when you're operating heavy instruments, <coughs> excuse me, you end up using wrists. Whereas in microsurgery, wrist movement should be minimal and finger movements should come into play. So it is more like uh, using the fingers, especially the first three, and then you sort of use it, not too much at the wrist, but sort of rotating at the fingers itself. So that gives a better control. And then you start adjusting the magnification and focus depending on the need. I have seen many surgeons over many years get a little confused in anatomy when there is a magnification factor coming into play. So I think it's a process of learning. You can't do it in one day. So learn how to adjust a appropriate focus, appropriate magnification for that given surgery. And in microscope, unlike other uh, places, you know, you have to use the uh, line of sight as the uh, uh, thing to see. Suppose you cannot see at a corner, you have to learn to use the microscope at an angle. And therefore that's when you should learn to use the line of sight you should learn where the axis cross and therefore, these are small things that learn, but these are important to understand. One of the advantages of microscope is you tend to avoid collateral damage while working at depth. But for that, as the instrument passes from a surface to the depth under high magnification, the surface structures may be inadvertently damaged and this should be kept in mind and it should be learned over time. And also to learn appropriate instrument, which instruments to use at the surface, at the depth. If you start off using a, sh a shorter length for surface and a longer length. And when you use longer lengths, you start having fine difficulties using, for example, uh, a needle holder, stuff like that. I mean, a good surgeons who just gave you all the uh, minimal access work prior to my talk, actually use all these things subconsciously. They don't look at it. They do it like as though it's an extension of their eyes and hands. But to come to that, it requires some degree of proficiency. So how do you learn microsurgery? You start uh, assisting an expert, get a proctor, start doing simple procedures, do more surface lesions and near to the surface and then go deeper. Now, the trick in uh, microsurgery is many times when you're doing a slightly larger lesion, you start losing your anatomy, sense of anatomy gets disturbed. Always go to the fixed anatomy first and then come back to the disturbed anatomy. And therefore that way you don't lose your 
direction inside a cavity. And when you're operating, the trick in microsurgery is the tip of the instruments must be always under vision. Don't do anything without seeing. If you're doing things without being seen, you're likely to damage a tissue, a vessel, a nerve, a bone, anything. Don't, uh, don't operate unless the tip is seen. To get better all the time, you have now laboratory sessions, cadaver courses, it's a continuous process as I repeatedly tell you, learn, learn, and learn. So there are some disadvantages, huh? microscope. Generally, it is a very physical thing. It's a big stuff. It can be parked in one OT. It can't be moved from place to place. Very easily, you start moving from one OT to another OT. The microscope will get spoiled very fast. We have kept microscopes. We have four microscopes in our theater. And all the microscopes tend to stay in that theater unless there is an exigency. <clears throat> one of the things that you must understand is microscopes have no real disadvantage as far as the usage is concerned. There are certain. For example, you can't see in certain corners. You can't do certain procedures in a very, very tiny hole, very deep uh, 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 processes, and the, the focus of vision comes narrower and narrower. Therefore, I think appropriate use of microscope requires certain skill and training. Now, I think the disadvantage of microscope is actually uh, directly related to the experience of a surgeon. As the experience becomes more and more, the disadvantages become less and less. Now, you can also add other instruments like endoscope. It has a very definitive indications, a lot of advantages, a lot of contraindications too. So let's see that. Basically, what it does uh, is that endoscope is a, a tubular uh, telescope, just like a microscope is a fixed telescope. It's a narrow telescope. But to magnify, <clears throat> you have a digital magnification uh, connector at the back. But to actually see, you have to go closer and closer to the anatomy. In a microscope, you don't have to go closer. And the anatomy comes close to you. Whereas in an endoscope, you have to go closer and closer. In a uh, microscope, as you go closer and closer, the field of view becomes narrower and narrower. Whereas in an endoscope, the field of view becomes more and more panoramic. So I think there are a, a certain advantages and disadvantages. You know, there are a lot of uh, tricks to learn. In a microscope, for example, both hands are free. In an endoscope, an assistant can hold it for you or an endoscope holder can hold, then both hands become free. If you're used to using an endoscope in one hand and operate, then you have a uni-handed surgeon. Of course, there are some tools are there which are attached to suction for the endoscope, like in the Destando system. But still, for example, you can't use sutures so easily in an endoscope, one-handed. Whereas in a microscope, you have you know uh, you have both hands to do a lot of things. You can use left hand or right hand for suturing, needle holder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm not saying one is better than other. I still feel uh, everything is an advantage. Learn to use the advantage of each. This is what I was trying to tell you, that the, in the microscope, you have a focus which comes narrower and narrower. In an endoscope, it's a very, very nice panoramic view as you go. One of the advantages of <coughs> endoscopes are that you can see at corners. And this is a pictorial representation of what you see. There are many kinds of microscopes. We are used to uh, one set of microscopes called from the Zeiss. I've been using my Zeiss microscope for 35 years. Nowadays, you have something new called the exoscope. In the exoscope, there is a uh, system of lens and the coaxial illuminator like a microscope, but you end up seeing the image on a 3D or a very high definition uh, uh, screen, and you can actually get the same microscopic picture onto the screen. In the earlier days, using this uh, uh, you know, visualization system, there used to be a lag period for the image to be processed from the computer or the microscope or exoscope onto the TV screen. But now this period has become so fast that there's hardly any lag period. So you can start using for many procedures. Several surgeons in the world use a lot of spine procedures using exoscope. So this, this, three minutes more. Yes, this is the latest uh, system that we have in our hospital called the Kinova 900. It is a very beautiful system. It is a very advanced microscope. It has an endoscope which can be attached. It's a microscope. You can get an endoscope picture in picture. You don't have to have any toggling. You just attach a cable to the microscope and the endoscope goes in. And in the eye view, 
you again eyepiece you can see the endoscope picture on one side and the microscope picture or you can put reverse is uh, on either side it can be used as an exoscope you can just raise the microscope head and then it becomes an exoscope and as dr murli said we have tumor fluorescence igc icg angiography i can actually see blood vessels in the spinal cord when you are operating when you inject a dye it is very useful in certain tumors tumor fluorescence is very good and one of the great things about microscopes is it is navigable nowadays the focus point of a microscope is navigable onto the uh, navigation screen suppose you are unsure of the anatomy at the depth and you are working inside a bony cavity or in relationship to a major vessel like an iota and you are doing a carpectomy and you are really not sure how deep it is you don't have to use an additional tool the focus of the microscope will tell you where exactly the navigation is and your is and therefore you can focus and see your say 1 cm away from a vena cava or an iota or some structure that you want to see one of the other advantages is it has a robotic automatic balance you just press button the whole thing adjusts itself there is a focus lock for example if you want to focus on an uh, area and you want to move the microscope anywhere else the focus doesn't change so so many new things are coming in and i think these are the advantages a surgeon starts using you use a microscope you use an exoscope you know mind uh, endoscope you use a navigable systems etc 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 in brain for example it's a phenomenal use you can overlay functional mri you can overlay lot of uh, images fiber tracts blood vessels angiography images and all of them can come to your aid and these tools are available already in india it's not that it was there somewhere else and you're not getting it it's available at a cost and the same thing will happen in uh spine surgery too over time you start merging images preoperatively into intraoperative fields and you start looking at the uh, overlay pictures and what we call as you know um, the the scientific term they're using is a, a robotic implantation of images which are overlaid one or another so when the whole systems come into play your surgery becomes safe you don't struggle you end up becoming a much better surgeon because your outcomes determine what kind of a surgeon you are so at the end of this are you using a microscope or an endoscope or an exoscope you end up being a very good microsurgeon you end up being a surgeon who uses all the tools that is necessary at hand and find and say look my outcomes are good and i thank you all for your attention thank you sir thank you very much as usual a lot of takes take on points uh with this we come to the end of the session thanks all uh, speakers thanks uh, dr alok dr amit zala dr sudhir dube dr vigas kupte dr nikhil dr umesh dr bala dr vishal kunnani and murli krishna to be on prime and thank you uh, uh, the standard sir and thanks arvind for the opportunity and we should thank dr uh, neeraj bijlani for being our technology pa uh, uh, partner for having all these sessions online on time and available also for review let me invite dr arvind to say the vote of thanks and uh, thanks very much for joining us on this sunday morning and uh, uh, giving support to misap please uh, stay tuned to this channel we'll be putting up our updates our reg regular misap session uh, and when is next planned thanks over to you arvind yeah thank you so much ranjit uh, so what the what, microscope has created many wonders one such big wonder is it is integrated ortho and neurosurgeons together under one banner so what we see today morning is you know national integration under the banner of microscope so microscope is an inevitable uh, instrument now uh, during surgery it is converted ortho spine surgeons into better spine surgeons and neurospinal spine surgeons into better uh, you know uh, spinal surgeons they are pushing their envelope to uh, to include many other indications so it's uh, as i said you know microscope makes uh, life look big and uh, we really had good uh, big people showing uh, uh, you know big videos through small holes as, and uh, you can appreciate the illumination and magnification how much uh, difference it makes and again i thank uh, dr vignesh uh, for a fantastic uh, paper that algorithm looks quite great to follow uh, dr murli for his uh, contribution dr kundani for uh, showing the footprint i think each of you should read his articles on uh, learning curve for uh, each particular surgery probably they can become a footprint for you uh, 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 you know to learn uh, mis uh, techniques and uh, various videos uninterrupted smooth flow uh, 
thanks uh, to Dr. Neeraj Vijlani for the smooth flow of all the videos. In other webinar, I've seen, you know, there's a lot of interruption in between and that really uh, takes the charm away from the presentation. And uh, again, our president uh, is like Dronacharya, he's taught us a lot of things and today was a revision of how to use a microscope. And uh, again, Ranjit, uh, heads off, uh, wonderful coordination, sitting in one place for two hours. And uh, last but not the least, uh, Carl Zies for this wonderful contribution and uh, Intas uh, for ever being with us. Thank you. And next uh, session will be on uh, 11th of October, that is the second sat Sunday of uh, October. And we'll again come out with a, a wonderful theme. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. We share a great Thank Sunday you. there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Dr.